that channel welcome right it's been a little while since i last made a video so i've got a few patrons to say thank you to we've got john l thomas fanning jiao nguyen nguyen it's a vietnamese name sorry i can't pronounce it uh daniel piotrowski catherine anna anna became a patron and then before i could send a message to say thank you she left again <laughs> some people do that it's kind of funny you can do rather than do that you can do like a custom pledge so you're not signing up for monthly like a monthly subscription you can just do custom pledge and then i've done it to other channels and uh just come and go like that uh so anyway thank you Anna. i do appreciate it and uh lt so thank you very much guys Pre appreciate all the patrons they basically own this channel they make it possible to continue so yeah really appreciate you guys i like making the videos and i've got a lot of stuff to share and it's all possible with the patrons um i do get a bit of money from youtube but it's so small it's like basically lunch money <laughs> for a month uh, anyway so today surprisingly if there's one aspect of making jewelry which I'm most expert in, it's ring sizing. And I've been doing this channel for like three years, four years, I don't even know anymore. And uh, I've never done a video on ring sizing, so I'm really surprised about that. So anyway, I've got one today. Uh, we're gonna size this ring down and I'll just talk about everything that goes through my mind and all the little tests and checks I do to achieve, achieve the size it needs to be. So let's get into it. Okay, this ring has featured on the channel before. You can see uh, it's been heated up. You can see the solder joins. Also, I did a video on checking over a ring to make sure it's to find potential problems and check it's safe for working on. So uh, this ring has been sort of kind of started already. But anyway, uh, as for actually doing the sizing, uh, you've got your fingers, your, your customer's finger size, and you know what size it needs to go down to. So I've decided, it hasn't got to be anything this one, but I'm just doing this for the video. I've decided L, so it's going down a bit of a chunk. Uh, sizing a ring down, because we're going to be cutting a piece out of the back and basically squashing the ends back together. So the ring goes through a bit of stress. One size, very rarely a problem. Two sizes, you need to start to look to be a bit careful. Everything's all strong, ready to go. Three sizes down. Again, it's all right, as long as you, you're confident the ring structurally can take it. Four sizes, you get a little bit exotic now. Five, six, it's all possible. Uh, you can also size a ring down. It doesn't have to be perfectly round. This stick for measuring the size is perfectly round, but people's fingers are not. So you can end up sizing a ring right down, but you can't change that curvature anymore because of the settings and stuff. So you can end up leaving that as it is, and then this kind of just squashes down. So you end up with a kind of rugby ball shape, which the customer can wear comfortably, but it just looks odd. You can do it and it can look all right. and It'll be comfortable, but uh, ideally, just make things round uh but you've got to do what you got to do if you're going down like five six sizes you can't always keep it round anyway so that's something to consider uh, i'm going down two and a quarter i think it was uh let me show you what i mean by quarters god so much to my, my brain is empty yet when i start these videos but when i actually start looking at things it just i can't speak fast enough to get all the words out <laughs> in my head uh, I think in the America they've got three or four of these sizes to one size. So ours, the UK size stick is quite specific. But even that, people do swear that they can feel a difference between that and that. <laughs> it was just like the circumference of a ring is like quarter of a millimeter. It's barely anything. Um, a lot of it's psychological, and like literally people can choose a size one day you do the job and they come back to collect it and then they think it's a bit loose or they think it's a bit tight and it's just down to like how hot the the weather was that day when they had their finger size so it's really specific and when people are unsure we used to tell them just to just try it because it's a lot of work to the ring it's a shame to cut it open just size it down quarter size it's a lot of work just for barely anything so I would say, I, I literally think almost every time people went away just to test it, they never came back again because they just got used to it and they just realised it was fine. They're just being fussy for just in a different mood. The weather was different. I don't know. It's, it's so specific. It becomes psychological, like when people want that or, or that. <laughs> yeah, so what do I say? So you've got to find out what size the ring actually is before you start cutting out. So you need to know how much you're working on it. So I would push it on a ring stick quite firm, make sure it's parallel to the lines. And then look down at it that way. If there's any gaps around it, that means it's not round. So I will take a soft hammer, my nylon one. I suppose a rawhide mallet would be good for this. It's just a, if it need, if it's gold, it needs a gentle tap. If it's something like a, a heavier sort of platinum ring shank, uh, you're gonna need to hit it quite hard, which is when you don't your rawhide mallet would be no good. So not a heavy heavy nylon one would be good. Uh, but I have since learned. Those rawhide mallets, like my one's really lightweight, mine's really old, but apparently they fill them with lead now, so they've got a bit of weight to them, so I can't imagine there's any problem with them. Anyway, 
whatever you've got to do, get it round and looking for the gap around there. If there's no gaps, you've got a perfectly round ring. So now you can really be confident the size is what you think it is. That I'm calling N and a quarter. So just talking about actually gauging the ring sizes. I, I can only do this specific to my experience though, which is gonna be a very English way because different countries have their different ring sticks. This is how we describe it, a, a ring size. So that'll be L. So the line for L goes through the middle of the shank. That'll be L trailing edge, or could just be L plus, the, my old boss used to write. A bit more than that, we've got L and a quarter, L and a half, L and three quarters. This would be M lead, oh, we call that L and three quarters plus, which basically means M leading edge in brackets, but don't start, I, I would suggest don't start naming other letters. It's still in the realms of L uh, as long as it's behind that line. So yeah, L and three quarters plus, no one ever had any misunderstanding saying that. Um, but yeah, and then you go on to M, obviously. Uh, anything more accurate than a quarter size is, like I said, you're in the realms of just psychological kind of like what mood the person's in. So if they if they think that's going to be more suitable, tell them to just at least try it. Because, uh, yeah, literally they can just walk a bit faster on their way home and then it'll feel tight. If you are like shop staff or someone working in the shop and then you're sizing, even if you're a jeweler, just taking the ring sizing for another jeweler to do, be very careful about what size you think it is and how far it's going to go down. Don't just say, like this one I'm saying is N and a quarter, but it's got to be size L. You might just put it on a stick really lightly and then say down two sizes to L and you give it to me just with just down two sizes, I'm going to do it to K and three quarters. And then you give it back to the customer and say, oh, it's too small, it's supposed to be size L, we did it wrong. So no, you said down two, That's, it was N and a quarter and you end up having arguments and stuff. That happened to us a lot of times in the place where I did my apprenticeship. There's three of us jewelers, two main jewelers and a the apprentice being trained up. It was a constant battle with the shop staff because they just wouldn't size people's fingers correctly. There's constant problems. And uh, for the shop staff, it's just like a bit of embarrassment with a customer. Um, but for us, it was like proper redoing jobs twice and getting in the way and mucking up deadlines for jobs we're already working on. It used to cause a lot of problems. And the biggest one, it was like, I remember this clearly because it was like my first like argument with, a, with an adult <laughs> in the working environment. Because I was a quiet, shy, uh, like 17 year old boy just starting my apprenticeship. And uh, one lady, I'll show you what she did. It's really annoying, it still annoys me today. <laughs> right, I, I don't wanna explain this because this is important. It can cause a massive problem if you don't do the ring sizings or write clearly. Uh, you know the letter N, yeah? Like, I would just do that. Obviously, the lady that took this job, she does Ns, she goes down, up, like that. She does an N like that. Unfortunately, she wrote it in a rush, and she did that. So I got that, size, ring size to W. Um, it was a lot. It was a lot of sizes. And guess what type of ring it was? It was like a Russian wedding ring. So three wedding rings all together they had to be separated, all sized individually, and put back together. Big, big job. And it was a lot of sizes. It was like a massive amount like that. So a lot of metal used, like almost a whole day doing it. And uh, yeah, and it was meant to be size N. So I had sized it up a massive amount and it was only meant to be sized up like a tiny amount. Um, yeah, a big balls up. And then since then, but like I say, people were laughing because I was arguing with her. I remember she said, oh, it's a case of nobody's fault then really. And I was like, no, it's because you wrote W instead of N. That's why we're in this mess. So after that episode, we used to say, don't just write the ring size, write the ring size like size, size N, like plus two to size N. And then if it said plus two to W, I, I would see that no, W is like six sizes up or whatever I did that day. Um, I, I can see there's a bit of an issue with the writing. So yeah, be careful with how you write. Like everything's got to be clear and precise. Business at the end of the day, people need to know what's going on. All right, so anyway, you're confident with the finger size, what it was, what it needs to be, ready to get going. So you've got it round, you heat it up, found the solder join. Uh, you've got to look inside, don't just pick, this one's got two joins, but don't just cut through it because you want to look inside. There might be engraving or a hallmark nearby. Uh, this one, I can get a focus. I've uh, got a choice of two, two solder joins, one, two, I might choose that one, but when I look inside, it's closer to the hallmark. It's totally possible to cut through that and not damage the hallmark, but less risk of cutting this one out. So I would choose that one, and I think there's another reason why it's a good choice. That's where this ring looks thinner, like it's been previously worked on and over-filed, so definitely I'm choosing that one to cut through. 
because this ring's a little bit, got a bit of a flat spot there, don't have to have to cut through the join, but the join has to be removed. So I can cut slightly more one side of it or cut through it and cut completely this side or cut through it and cut completely that side or cut it out in the middle because there's a bit of a flat on the ring. So there's an opportunity to kind of remove that flat as best possible and then join it up. So we're kind of eliminating that. So there's a chance to improve the ring as we work on it. So look for little tricks like that. Next, working on gold or platinum. It's nice to keep your lemon all separate. Did a video on that in the past. Make sure your skin is clean. Got little bits in here, might just get rid of those. Um, just, I like to keep gold and platinum and silver separate just for when I'm sending stuff to the scrap. I sort of know what I'm sending and can kind of make a cal calculation on what I might expect to get back. So anyway, right, so cutting through it now. So I'm having a look. I think I need to cut either side of my solder join to that flat is really directly over it. I forgot to talk about actually gauging how much to cut out of the ring. In between these sides, I reckon it's about one mil difference. You could do the maths, you could measure it one to the other and then do the circumference pi measurement uh, multiplication. Uh, anyway, so you can work it out, but I never do that. I, I don't really work by numbers and maths. I do a lot of it by feel and by eye is what a lot of this job is about. So anyway, a guide is about one millimeter per size. So I'm looking to cut out about two mil and you're much, much better off cutting out too little and then uh, testing it, okay, a bit more, testing it a bit more, and then making final adjustments. Ideally, you close it up, and then you just gotta cut through the join once while it's closed, so then it joins up really tight and nice at the correct size. Uh, if you cut out too much, if you cut out a little bit too much, it's not terrible, but then you're back to getting this hammer and tapping it on thicker parts of the shank to try and stretch it up. It's, <laughs> not ideal at all because you're putting the ring under a lot of stress and you're thinning out sections and stuff is don't really want to go there so ideally better than that you're better off spending slowing down a little bit and spending a bit more time to make multiple cuts to get the correct size but sometimes after a bit of experience you'll cut it cut one two and then join it up cut through the joint it's exactly perfect it happens a lot once you've got the experience uh, but yeah better off going slowly slowly okay half round pliers um, ideally I'm trying to bend it but keep it circular because uh, there's less stress when it goes back on the ring shank and stuff and also you've uh, got more control of what size it is if you start just pushing them flat next time you put it on a stick you don't really know confidently what size it is so you want to keep it round as best possible um, a good trick I think I've mentioned this on the channel before I've got like a little bit of steel tube here you can use a bit of copper a bit of gas pipe but it's a bit too soft if you can find a bit of metal this is just something come from Ikea, I think. Just a little bit of tube was in the box I didn't need, so it's now my tool for this. It just increases the circumference, the curvature of your pliers. You can use something big like that as well. If you haven't, you can cheat. Just put a bit of tube on your smaller ones. Oh, I tend to use them quite a lot. Uh, anyway, so keeping it round, I'm thinking of bending mine from about there. If I bend it there, you just end up just pulling them, pulling them straight. And like I say, you wanna keep it round as best possible. Best possible. Um, something soft and thin like this so I can literally just hold it there and just sort of push down my thumb if not being careful not putting stress on the on the head on the settings and stuff uh, I don't know, just keep it keep it keep it in your mind what's, what's actually happening to the ring and you shouldn't go too far long too far wrong so that's closed up look, and it's gone round so test that on my stick I don't think that's gonna be enough yeah, it's gone down like one size, look. So, same again. Look at the side. Which side should I cut out to improve? This, this side's a bit more flat still. So I'm doing the same again. When you're cutting through a thin ring shank, be careful. The um, teeth of the saw blade don't grip. So sometimes you get to this last bit and it sort of yanks it down and that can pull a shank out of shape. But you'll get a feel of how strong it is because when you're cutting it, it will be flexing a certain amount. But yeah, thin, thin rings can be difficult to cut through nicely. So see that, I'm bending it, but from nowhere near the join really, it'll be more accurate, take that off. Hold it right back there, push it down my thumb. Like I say, it's not really a rule on this, it's just, you just feel it, just do what you gotta do. Just 
I used to like ring sizings like this because sometimes I'd have like a really expensive gemstone to make a mount for. I've got to work really accurately, really carefully. But you can't just turn up in the morning and just get on with it and be a, start a really focused job. So I would, I, if possible, I would like to start the day, I just call it a warm-up job, and just do a, a job like this where you'll work skillfully and carefully, but um, it's not too much stress on your, on your mind. <laughs> so I used to sort of warm up my fingers and get my brain in gear by doing a job like this. So uh, we're sizing down to L, yeah? So I'm approaching it, like gently on there. It's going just above L. And looking at the side, I've got a bit of a gap there. So I think I probably would push up to L and a half if I really had soldered that and tapped it around. So I'm gonna cut out a little bit more. Um, I mean, I say that, I may cut it out for the side. I think it's gonna cut out too much. What I'm gonna do is hold that closed and then just cut through the join. I may need to do that twice. I think that's probably safer than actually cutting out a piece on the side. I think that's going to get rid of too much metal. Just line these up nicely. They've gone a bit scissored. So this shank's a bit thin. This might be difficult. Let's see how it goes. So I'm holding it. See that? One finger supporting there. That finger and my thumb are squeezing it together gently. I need to hold it securely, he says, as he drops it. <laughs> I'll let it out, don't worry. <laughs> and I'm gonna carefully cut through that join. A thin, sharp, efficient saw blade is what you need. So it's not yanking it about too much. You're not pushing down on it. I'm, like, I'm barely putting more than the weight of my finger on my saw. Oop, there you go. It always catches that last little, it's like a last little burr has got to get out. So that's opened it up. Like, can you see that? I don't know if you can see that. There's a bit of a gap there. That's just opened up a tiny amount. We lost the tension in the ring now. So that's not closing itself back up. Remember that first cut? It, I cut out a piece and it immediately shut itself up again. That's that's gone now. That amount of tension. So I'm just gonna let, I'm just letting the camera roll so you can really see what's going on as I size this. Okay, what I'm doing now is I'm opening it up just at the ends. This is in a effort to keep it circular. So I've just lifted up the ends, and then I'm gonna close it up again from here. running my finger there's a lot of stuff I do automatically I don't actually really know so I just I watched myself work and then I got to talk about what just happened so yeah I put my finger over it so I'm feeling if they're in line or not I'm not just looking I can just run my finger over it I can, obviously I can feel that join but it's it's smooth it's not like a big bump there so I'm expecting that to be a bit closer I might need to do that again though let's just sit in that's pretty good that might be it you know yeah I think that's it okay that's ready to sold up um, obviously I finished with that cut going through it. I was actually expecting to do that again, but it took out more than I thought. Um, yeah, finish by cutting it through the join and that way join should be really tight. I'll show you, I'll show you now how good that join is. That, that looks good enough for soldering. So this is exactly as it was just in my hand. Look with a 10 times loop, you can see it's just slightly scissored. That top needs to come across the left, the bottom needs to go to cross, across to the right a little bit, just to eliminate that little step there. Um, but actually looking around the join, it is closed up pretty well. Oh yeah, look, that needs to come down. See that bottom one, that needs to come down. Um, that inner edge, I think is better. It's easier for you, for your working, and for the ring, I think, to get that really accurate. Concentrate on that. If you're gonna get one thing correct, get it, uh, or I say two things are most important out of three is get that inner 
circumference lined up really nicely so that's not step in and then get the scissor in lined up really precise so the mine's slightly off look uh, those two are more important than the outside one and it's because that is so easy to just file over that and get that sorted out it's more difficult to file nicely and to clean up nicely and uh, there's a risk to the hallmarks and engraving and stuff working on the inside so if that's just takes the minimum amount of work to clean up much better and then the sides obviously if they're scissored if you solder them up scissored and then start flattening it you just make the ring look really thin really accidentally really easily so uh yeah definitely get the scissoring sorted get that inner edge sorted those two are more important than that last dimension of that outer little step but ideally just all lines up nicely talking about that inner circumference um hopefully i'm gonna aim to do it like i would at my best level which might not happen because I've done this for years, but uh, I want to show you it done well so uh, I can explain, or so you can see uh, how much e easier it is if you don't have to work on the inside of the ring much. Okay, for actually doing the solder, I've got my tweezers clamping it away from the solder join. Um, yes, yeah, so got my tweezers in the slot on the bench peg so they're just squeezing tight, just squeeze them in there. Uh, first thing I do, get my flux. I just paint over the stones and all over this bit because this is rhodium plated so I'm protecting the stones from the heat and also the rhodium plating as well but I'm not expecting it to get very hot. Uh, I've got another join there I don't know if that's done with like easy solder so I've selected medium solder to do this could do it in hard I'm sure but just like I keep talking about risk management just eliminating problems before they happen so there's no risk of it getting too hot and then that easy solder join if it is easy flooding and going in the engraving inside and stuff uh, just eliminating messes so anyway the rhodium plate is not going to get burnt diamonds are protected bit of flux over the join i'll just cook that on now a little bit of solder what I do is i put a can't show you this on camera. I, I keep my finger touching the bit I'm gonna, I'm about to cut off so it doesn't ping off. There you go, just that little square there, look. See that? No, oh, you can't see that, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. Just there, just chip that off. It's a chipped, not shit. It's probably best practice to pick that up with a wet brush and then touch it on your join. If there's a bit of heat on the ring, which there should be, if you just cook that flux on, it should stick on there relatively easily. So that's my solder on top of my join just there. Medium solder should be relatively easy. So gentle flame. My torch is back a bit so it cooks. If you boil the flux too fast, it's likely the solder will ping off. You can see the flux boiling on the on the stones lip. There you go. <laughs> so that's gone. Look at the inside now. I need to. I want to flood it and make sure that's pulling through. Yeah, done. So I'll show you that up close. So this is the rings. Cool down a little bit now. Only took like. 20 seconds not even that um yeah so look the ring is quite round the diamonds and the rhodium plate undisturbed you can see the flux has boiled on them hasn't really got them any much much hotter than just the boiling temperature uh other solder join undisturbed let me show you up close the benefit of tight joins and lining it up nicely on the inside where's my solder join that literally does not need to be filed on the inside. I can just put that on a ring stick because it's already round. I haven't got to force it at all. Um, I'll just put it on the ring stick and just give it one, maybe two. I could probably do it in one. One tap of the hammer and then that's it. And then it's ready for papering. I didn't need to file it inside. So it eliminates thinning the ring out, uh, removing engraving, damaging hallmarks and stuff. Uh, yeah, structurally, the ring's not going to change hardly at all. And then I'm not going to make any change to the inside at all really just a bit of papering and uh the sides lined up so when i file the sides it's not going to get thinner and yeah just the the main blob of solder is on the top so i just remove that 
and the ring is ready for papering and polishing. I've got to put in the acid, obviously, so I'll, I'll do that and then we'll do that work. I'll just show you again, since it's now it's been in the acid, just because it looks a bit different, but it uh, takes hardly any work to sort out the inside blobs on the outside. Some jewelers used to say they put solder on the inside when they're soldering a ring, like you might hold it in your tweezers like that, so sort of squeezing the join tight, uh, and then put a bit of solder there and solder that in. I don't like that because that blob, like I've got on the outside, is then on the inside. So then you definitely have to do a lot of work on the inside. I think you're much better off putting solder on the outside and then pulling it through with a bit of heat from the inside. And then that way you've got minimum work to do. That's just my preference. I did go for a stage of holding a ring like that and cutting it through the solder join from the inside. But even that I don't do anymore just because I find it's just easier to hold it more securely on the bench peg. So anyway, do what you got to do. Uh, like I say in this channel, I, I'm not too strict on telling people they've got to do things the way I do it, but uh, I do try to give you reasons for the way I do things and then I back it up by showing you and then explaining why I believe it's best to, uh, the way I do stuff. So anyway, there you go. So let's move on. Okay, pick up my ring stick. I've always got a habit of just doing that, just wiping it in case there's like dust on there, just to get that off the, off the stick. Uh, putting it on the, on the mandrel. Look, all that turning I did with the pliers, barely gone off round. I'm going to support that just over my solder join and then one tap. That's the inside <laughs> fully worked on. <laughs> Not fully, I've got to paper it. But yeah, so I just flattened that. There would have been a tiny bump of solder in there, just flatten that. I shouldn't make out that's all you've got to do. You've got to make sure the ring's round again. So I've got a bit of a gap on the shoulders. Just trying to get the ring nice and round again. I think that's it. The ring was scissored a little bit, remember? So it's nice to give it a tap. Not essential you do this. Be careful because hitting it on the side can size the ring up. So if you are going to tap it on the side, do it very carefully. Uh, just make sure it's parallel and flat, basically. So you want it perfectly circular, you want it perfectly flat. Uh, ring's got to be in a good shape. So I've got a coarse whizzer, which can go on the inside. There you go, it's done. <laughs> that is literally it. I just hit it with a smoother one as well, just to aid polishing. Um, I think I mentioned previously, it might have been a patron, official patrons only video. With repairs and ring sizings, I don't, I'm not, overly concerned with the polish on the inside of the ring. I just, I think maintaining its thickness and uh, its structural rigidity is more important than having a beautifully polished inside of the ring. Get it good, but do like 90% 90, 90 of what it should be perhaps, because uh, you are wearing out the metal where the hallmarks and engraving sit. So, I mean, I literally have left areas over engraving um, hardly cleaned up at all, really. Like I've just barely touched them with a smooth, whizzer and then only polished it with cotton on the inside so it's just brightened up uh, just because engraving was already going thin you know people are wearing a ring over like 50 years it does wear out the inside of the ring eventually so engraving goes thin over many decades so you need to preserve it if possible uh, so anyway that's the inside done um, tap the side you can um, i don't think i need to file mine i'm just gonna go straight to a course Stick. So if you work neatly with a tight join, you need minimum amount of solder, and then this part of the ring, this part of the job, is really quick as well, because you're not battling through all the stages of filing and going through all the grades of paper. Uh, you just very light touches on bus sticks and stuff. And then you've got this lump on the outside you'll get rid of. When you're filing off solder, I would say try to only file the lump of solder because as soon as you're filing the metal either side of it you're making the ring thinner there's always a bit of collateral damage you've got to blend it in obviously but just try to obviously follow the curvature of the ring and then not not over file it like what's already happened to this ring If 
think. Oh yeah, tapped up here. A few hammer marks. Or I tapped it there. I think this is ready for a polish now. So before I polish this, this is the the nature of repairs. Yeah, like if I'm making that from new, there's no way I'd leave it like that. I'd, like the the side wall, the flat side wall is all over the place. I would neaten that all out, and I can do that really easy on this ring. But I've just got to leave it as it is. It's I've already eliminated a bit of a flat section there. Um, the ring has improved, but as for that, I'm just taking metal off a customer's ring, and they didn't ask me to, so uh, I'm not. I'm not going to touch it any more than that, although I easily could improve it further. Uh, so from that, let's just give it polish. I'm not going to record the polishing because this video is just about the doing the sizing work, but just a few tips about it. These felt discs are good for the sides of rings. If you've got a flat there, just touch it there and there, that starts that off. Then I'll do the inside and I'd concentrate only on the bit I worked on, uh, just very lightly brighten up the rest. Uh, that head is rhodium plating. Uh, the rhodium plating is puffed, as perfect as it was, so it would be a shame if I polished off the rhodium plating on the inside. I'd have to redo it. So I'm gonna, when I polish this, I'm just not gonna touch the head at all. Uh, maybe just very, very lightly touch the top of the claws. Um, I don't wanna remove the plating, so I'm gonna work around that. And um, but yeah, just like I said, like I'm not gonna improve it further. Like I could easily neaten up the side, but that is to do that is to take metal away from the customer's ring, which I haven't asked me to do. So I'm gonna leave it at that stage. And uh, same with the polishing. Like I'm not gonna go mad on the inside. It hasn't got to be perfectly, perfectly polished. It is a sort of uh, a kind of it's a ring sizing, but it's in the realms of doing repair work. So you have gotta be respectful for what it is, how much it weighs, <laughs> the amount of time you're spending on it. Um, yeah, keep costs down for the customer as well, so it doesn't have to be re-rhodiumed. Uh, although if they, if they, this is actually good condition, so that's why I'm looking after it. If it did need redoing or you did claw work and stuff, obviously you've got to redo that anyway. So anyway, it doesn't need redoing, so I'm going to be careful with that. And uh, yeah, just lightly polish the, the ring, so to get it to like 90%, but it is a sort of repair, so I'm not overly concerned with it coming out perfect. There you go, that's what I call a 90%er, uh, not being overly concerned with it. Like, you could look at it, even with magnification, looks fine. Uh, my experience is customers, they don't really think about the process of it, they don't really understand about cutting it and filing it and <laughs> putting in acid and stuff, probably better, they don't know. Sounds a bit scary to them. Um, but yeah, when they get when you give them a ring back and it's all cleaned and polished and uh, it fits, they're usually very happy to have that because they weren't thinking ahead and expecting to have something so new looking and quite often, They've been wearing a ring for years. They haven't seen it look like that for years, so they, they sort of forgot to appreciate how much it's uh, how, how how bright it was when it was new. Anyway, so yeah, do what you got to do. Um, that's just I wanted to actually go through it and just leave the camera rolling, so so I can talk about not only show the work but talk about what goes through my mind as I'm doing the job. Uh, that's a relatively easy one, yeah. Um, 18 carat with diamonds and stuff you can't go too far wrong. It's usually going to be quite quite uh, simple easy to accomplish ring sizing but it can it can get really really difficult like if that was platinum or like gold side so you've got mixed metal shank really thick strong one set with stones like peridots or aquas and tanzanites and stuff that are delicate to acids and heat and any sort of stress uh it can get really really tricky but even even like a there was a period like made in china rings they're really thin shanks white gold uh, but they were so springy, like the metal was so hard. As soon as you cut through them, they spring open a bit like that and you just couldn't get them to sit together. You'd end up having to clamp them like really strong in your tweezers to get them to hold together and then solder them. Uh, there's difficulties with each ring, so uh, that's a quick, easy one. It can get tricky. You just got to kind of work out how to overcome problems on a case by case. So if that video is useful to you, click like and subscribe. If you want to take it a step further, you, become, you can become a patron. It's patreon.com forward slash diamond link in description. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping to make more new YouTube videos coming soon. See you then.